What is a science according to the thought of Thomas Aquinas? To answer the question, what is science, we first need to know the three operations of the intellect according to Thomas Aquinas. The first operation is called simple apprehension or the understanding of indivisibles. In this operation, we understand simple concepts like dog, human, and cannonball. The second operation is called knowledge by composition and division, or more simply, judgment. In this operation, we either compose concepts from the first operation or divide them. For instance, the sentence, every dog is a mammal, composes the concept mammal with the concept dog. In the sentence, no dog is a reptile, divides the concept reptile from the concept dog. Third operation of the intellect is called knowledge by reasoning. In this operation, we reason from something known, such as every mammal is an animal and every dog is a mammal, to something unknown, like every dog is an animal. The first operation corresponds to words or names or terms. Third operation corresponds to sentences or propositions. The third operation corresponds to syllogisms or arguments. Let's look at the parts of a syllogism, also known as an argument. Consider the following syllogism. 1. Every bird is born in an egg. 2. Every eagle is a bird. 3. Therefore, every eagle is born in an egg. Every syllogism is composed of multiple propositions, like the example syllogism here. One proposition is called the conclusion because it is known by means of other propositions, which themselves are called premises or principles. The conclusion in the example given is, every eagle is born in an egg. The premises in the example given are, every bird is born in an egg, and every eagle is a bird. The premises and conclusion are themselves composed of terms. Terms are words or phrases, not complete sentences. These are included within the syllogism. So in the syllogism we have as an example here, we have three terms. First, bird, which appears twice in the premises. Second, born in an egg, which appears once in the premise and once in the conclusion. And then finally, the term eagle, which also appears once in a premise and once in the conclusion. There are two kinds of propositions. Self-evident propositions, which are called in Latin per se nota, and non-self-evident propositions, which are called non per se nota. These Latin phrases should be memorized. There are three kinds of self-evident propositions. First, ones in which the predicate is contained in the definition of the subject. These are the most obvious kinds of self-evident propositions. For instance, every bachelor is unmarried. Gold is a metal. Every triangle has three sides. Unmarried is contained in the definition of bachelor, metal is contained in the definition of gold, and has three sides is contained in the definition of triangle. And therefore, in each case, the proposition is obvious or self-evident, precisely because the predicate is contained in the definition of the subject. A second kind of self-evident proposition is one in which the subject is contained in the definition of the predicate, and the subject cannot be without the predicate. For instance, every number is odd or even or every human can laugh. The third kind of self-evident proposition is one in which the subject causes the predicate. For instance, he who is fatally stabbed dies. Being fatally stabbed causes death, and therefore the subject causes the predicate. Here's another example. The dog that is starving tries to eat. Obviously, starving causes the trying to eat. Here are some examples of non-self-evident propositions. Socrates is smart. Every natural body is corruptible. The moon is eclipsed. These are all non-self-evident propositions because they're either contingently true or because they must be proved from something prior which is self-evident. Propositions which are false would also be propositions which are non-self-evident. How do we prove an, a self-evident proposition? Well, strictly speaking, we cannot prove a self-evident proposition because it's obvious or self-evident. We cannot demonstrate that self-evident propositions are true. But sometimes people do deny self-evident propositions, and this can be either because they don't understand the meaning of the words in the proposition or because they are being dishonest. There are a few strategies for countering these two reasons.
The first strategy is to make sure that your interlocutor, or the person you're talking to, understands the meaning of the words in the proposition. So just go through the proposition, make sure that the person you're speaking to understands what the words mean. Maybe use a dictionary. The second strategy is to show how denying the proposition forces the person you're speaking to, the interlocutor, to deny something that they won't actually want to deny. Let's look at an example. Suppose that John denies that bachelors are unmarried. Perhaps this is because he thinks that bachelor means somebody with an under undergraduate degree and doesn't realize that bachelor means unmarried male. To solve this problem, you could just pull out a dictionary and show him the definition of bachelor. When he sees that bachelor means unmarried male, he'll immediately grant the proposition that he previously denied, namely that all bachelors are unmarried. Here's another example. Suppose that Philippa denies that triangles have three sides. Now she probably knows what triangle means and she probably knows what three sides means. So it's unlikely that pulling out a dictionary will help. You might ask her why she thinks that triangles don't have three sides. Perhaps she'll say that a triangle can have as many sides as we want it to have. In this case, you could ask her, well, is a triangle the same as a square? She'll probably say no. But you could say, well, what if I want a triangle to have four sides? In that case, a triangle would be a square. But she's denied that a triangle is a square, and therefore she's forced to go back and reaffirm the proposition she previously denied, namely that triangles have three sides. Proving non-self-evident propositions is another story. We can demonstrate that non-self-evident propositions are true by relating them to self-evident propositions. The following is an example of proving a non-self-evident proposition. Here we're going to prove the non-self-evident proposition that every natural body is corruptible. Premise 1. Everything composed of parts which can be separated is corruptible. Premise 2. Every natural body is composed of parts which can be separated. Conclusion. Therefore, every natural body is corruptible. Notice the first two premises are both self-evident propositions and the conclusion is a non-self-evident proposition which is derived from the first two premises. This argument is taken from general natural philosophy, also known as physics. Here's another example of proving a non-self-evident proposition. We're going to prove the proposition that to kill Socrates is wrong. This example is taken from moral philosophy or ethics. Premise 1. To kill an innocent person is wrong. Premise 2. To kill Socrates would be to kill an innocent person. Therefore, to kill Socrates is wrong. Here's a final example of proving a non-self-evident proposition, this time taking an example from astronomy. Prove the non-self-evident proposition that the Earth is round. Premise 1. Whatever casts a shadow that is circular is round. In a lunar eclipse, the Earth casts a shadow that is circular. Conclusion. Therefore, the Earth is round. Again, notice that the first two propositions are self-evident, whereas the conclusion is not self-evident. At least, while we're standing here on Earth, we can't see that the Earth is round. But, from the two premises, we can reason to the conclusion that the Earth is round. Again, this example is taken from astronomy. Let's summarize what we've said so far. There are three operations of the intellect. First, the understanding of indivisibles, also called simple apprehension, which corresponds to words, names, and terms. Second, understanding by composition and division, which corresponds to sentences and propositions. We subdivided the second operation of the intellect into two kinds, self-evident or per se nota propositions and non-self-evident or non-per se nota propositions. The third operation of the intellect, as we said, was understanding by reasoning, which corresponds to syllogisms and arguments. Now, the way we get to a non-self-evident proposition is as follows. First, we have simple apprehension, which is also called understanding of indivisibles. This corresponds, as we said, to words, names, and terms, 
but the combination of these words, names, and terms can result in self-evident propositions, or 2A. But then we move from self-evident propositions through syllogisms or arguments in the third operation of the intellect to the end result, which is non-self-evident propositions, which are the conclusions of certain syllogisms composed of self-evident propositions, which themselves are composed of simple names or words or terms. Science is a certain kind of intellectual virtue. So before we answer the question, what is science, we first need to answer the question of what is an intellectual virtue. Intellectual virtues are good habits in the intellect. Habits themselves are qualities in the soul by which the soul is inclined to act well or ill. A good habit is one by which the soul is inclined to act well. So science is a habit in the intellectual part of the soul by which that part of the soul is inclined to act well. Now that we've seen what intellectual virtue is, let's subdivide it into its most general kinds. First, we're going to subdivide intellectual virtue into speculative knowledge, which is knowledge of the truth for its own sake, and practical knowledge, which is knowledge for the sake of something else, whatever that be. Speculative knowledge is sometimes also called theoretical knowledge. Speculative or theoretical knowledge is subdivided into understanding, which is knowledge of the truth, which is self-evident, and which corresponds to the second operation of the intellect. Science, which is knowledge of the truth by reasoning from self-evident principles, and which corresponds to the third operation of the intellect. And wisdom, which caps off both understanding and science by including them. Wisdom is knowledge that includes both understanding of first principles of all being and science from such principles of all being to further propositions. This corresponds to both the second and the third operation of the intellect. Practical knowledge is subdivided into moral philosophy, which is the science of human actions as ordered to an end, and art or craft or skill, which is science for the sake of making something, such as a product. Moral philosophy is subdivided into ethics, which considers human actions as belonging to an individual, domestic science, which considers human actions as belonging to a household, and politics or political philosophy, which considers human actions as belonging to a political community, such as Athens or the United States of America. Art is subdivided into servile arts and liberal arts. Servile arts are ones that make a product which is for the sake of some use. Liberal arts are arts which make a product which is for its own sake. So to make this more specific, a servile art is something like uh, engineering, which makes something useful, whereas a liberal art is something like logic, which produces a quality in the soul which is not for the sake of some use, but which is good in itself. Now let's look at some more examples of the intellectual virtues we've just divided. First, let's look at an example of understanding. Consider the sentence, every animal has sensation. This is an example of understanding because it's a self-evident proposition which we habitually know. Also the sentence, every triangle has three sides, is again an example of understanding because it's a self-evident sentence that we habitually know. Some examples of science are physics, biology, psychology, and metaphysics. Some examples of wisdom are metaphysics and sacred theology. We'll talk about these more later on. Now let's look at some examples of the arts. First, let's look at an example of servile arts. Servile arts are things like engineering, architecture, cooking, medicine, nursing. All of these are for the sake of some practical benefit. They serve some bodily good. In contrast, liberal arts are things like logic, music, arithmetic, and grammar. While these might happen to be useful, they're not for the sake of a product which is itself useful, but instead they're for the sake of a product which is a good in itself, like a quality of the mind. Now let's look at some habits of the intellect that are not virtues. A virtue, as we said before, is a sort of habit that makes its possessor act well. Understanding, science, wisdom, practical philosophies, 
and arts are all virtues. Opinion, or belief, suspicion, error, and fallacy are all habits of the intellect that are not virtues because they do not necessarily make one act well. Someone has an opinion or suspicion when he or she holds to some proposition without a certainty of that proposition being true. A suspicion is stronger than an opinion since a person is inclined to believe one thing. Now, an opinion or suspicion arises either because the proposition is not necessarily true or false. For instance, Socrates is tan is not necessarily true or false because on any given day it could be one or the other. Or the person holding the proposition doesn't know why it is necessarily true or false. For instance, someone may hold the opinion that the earth is flat because they don't understand the necessity of the earth being round. Someone has error when he or she holds a false opinion. Someone makes a fallacy when he or she reasons or syllogizes incorrectly. Notice that error is a kind of opinion, but not all opinions are errors. Some opinions are true, some suspicions are true, but all errors are opinions. Now that we know what a science is, how many sciences are there? A science is a virtue in the intellect by which we know truths by reasoning from self-evident premises. That's the definition we gave before. But we don't distinguish sciences merely by how many different truths there are that can be known through reasoning. Otherwise, there'd be a science for all sorts of things. There isn't a unique science for dog with brown hair, and another science for dogs with gray hair, and another for telescopes, and another for giraffes. But how do we distinguish how many different kinds of sciences there are? Our general rule is to distinguish sciences by their objects. Here's an analogy. The object of sight is color, the object of hearing is sound. But what is the object of sciences like physics or mathematics? Here's some relevant facts before we apply this general rule to a more specific rule. The intellect is immaterial in the thought of Thomas Aquinas, thus its object must be something immaterial. A science knows conclusions from self-evident premises, thus what a science knows must be necessary or unchanging because self-evident premises are necessary. Here's our specific rule, which is an adaptation of the general rule based on the relevant facts we've just brought up. We will distinguish sciences from one another by their object's degree of separation from matter and separation from motion. Let's think a little bit more closely about how this specific rule is derived from the general rule and from the relevant facts we brought up. First, the general rule gave us the part of the specific rule where it requires that we look at the object of the science. The first relevant fact that the intellect is immaterial and thus its object must be immaterial gives us this part of the specific rule where we require that we distinguish sciences based on their degree of separation from matter. The second relevant fact gives us the second criteria that we look for degree of separation from motion in the object of the science in question. Since the rule we just laid out is to distinguish sciences based on their object's degree of separation from matter and motion, we need to distinguish different kinds of matter. The first kind of matter to consider is individual matter. This is that by which different individuals of the same species are distinguished. This can also be called designated matter or signate matter. These other names should be memorized. Here's an example. Socrates is flesh and bones and Plato's flesh and bones. Notice Socrates and Plato both belong to the same species, namely the human species, and yet they're different individuals. The matter by which they differ from one another is Socrates' flesh and bones and Plato's flesh and bones. This is individual matter. The opposite of individual matter is common matter, which is a kind of matter that is capable of being found in multiple individuals of the same species. So, for instance, Socrates and Plato both have flesh and bones, even if not the exact same flesh and bones. 
They don't have numerically the same flesh and bones, but they both have flesh and bones. So common matter is the opposite of individual matter. On the other hand, there's also sensible matter. Now, sensible matter could be either individual matter or it could be common matter. Sensible matter is matter with qualities by which it is capable of affecting the senses. For instance, it's capable of affecting sight, hearing, smell, taste, or touch. Sensible matter is opposed to intelligible matter. This is matter which is not capable of affecting the senses of sight, hearing, smell, taste, or touch. For instance, what triangles and squares in your imagination are made up out of is the intelligible matter of triangles and squares. This isn't something that we could see or hear, but it is matter. Intelligible matter also can be either individual matter or common matter. So to summarize, sensible matter, which is matter which we can see, taste, touch, etc., is opposed to intelligible matter. But neither sensible matter nor intelligible matter is opposed to individual matter or to common matter. On the other hand, common matter is opposed to individual matter and vice versa, but neither individual matter nor common matter is opposed to sensible matter or intelligible matter. Now that we've established a specific rule for distinguishing the different kinds of science, namely their object's degree of separation from matter and motion, and now that we've distinguished the different kinds of matter, we're now capable of distinguishing the different kinds of science. There are three species of science. The first is natural philosophy. Natural philosophy is the science of mobile being. It abstracts from individual matter only. In fact, it defines its objects in terms of common sensible matter. The objects in natural philosophy depend on sensible matter both to exist and to be defined. For instance, we cannot define an ear without reference to the flesh out of which it is made. Other names for natural philosophy are natural science and physics. The branches of natural philosophy, among others, are general physics, which is the science of mobile being in general, psychology, which is the study of the principle of living or self-moving things, namely the soul or psyche, and biology, which is the study of living or self-moving things. Second species of science is mathematics, which is the science of quantitative being. This abstracts from both individual matter and sensible matter. It defines its objects in terms of common intelligible matter. The objects of mathematics, like those of natural philosophy, depend on sensible matter in order to exist, but unlike those of natural philosophy, do not depend on sensible matter in order to be defined. For instance, I cannot define an ear without reference to flesh, I can't define a tree without reference to bark and wood, yet I can define a sphere or a square without reference to brawn or wood, even though squares and spheres only ever exist in some sort of sensible matter like bronze or wood. Branches of mathematics are things are geometry, which is the science of quantitative beings with, with position, such as triangles, and Arithmetic, which is the science of quantitative beings without position, such as numbers. Triangles are said to have position because, for instance, their sides need a certain relation to each other, whereas numbers have no position at all. The third species of science is metaphysics. This is the science of being in general, or being qua being, or being in as much as it is being, or being under the aspect of being. All of these phrases mean essentially the same thing. Metaphysics judges its object to be separate from all matter, not just sensible matter, not just intelligible matter, not just individual matter, but all matter. Objects in metaphysics depend on matter neither to exist nor to be understood. But there are two kinds of these objects. The first is positively immaterial objects. These are never in matter, such as God and angels. The other kind is neutrally immaterial. These are sometimes in matter and sometimes not, for instance, substance, being, act, potency, and unity. Other names for metaphysics, among many, are first philosophy and theology. Metaphysics is more immaterial than mathematics. Mathematics is more immaterial than natural philosophy.
Thus, there are three kinds of science because they differ from each other in their degree of separation from matter and motion. These three sciences judge the truth of their conclusions in different ways. The natural philosopher judges the truth of his conclusions by their conformity to the observations of the external senses, such as sight, hearing, smell, taste, and touch. This is why natural philosophers will often use things like microscopes or telescopes to bring the external senses closer in contact with the things being studied. Mathematics, in contrast, leaves the external senses behind and instead judges the truth of its conclusions by their conformity to the object and the imagination. This is why a mathematician will often use drawings to aid his imagination in judging the truth of his conclusions. Nevertheless, he doesn't use the drawing itself as a measure of whether his conclusions are true because the drawing, which is an object of the external senses, not the imagination, is always imprecise. The drawing is just there to aid his imagination in judging the truth of his conclusions. The metaphysician must leave both imagination and the senses behind. He judges his conclusions merely by reason alone. Not all sciences fall perfectly within natural philosophy, mathematics, or metaphysics. That's because it is possible to study things that are the object of one science, such as biology, using the principles that are found in another science, such as geometry. Examples of mixed sciences are classical and quantum mechanics, astrophysics, optics, chemistry, experimental psychology, sociology, and political science. All of these study something which is the object of natural philosophy, but they do so using principles taken from mathematics. Thus, there are mixed sciences because they don't study something from natural philosophy as something from natural philosophy, but instead as something from mathematics. Let's take a closer look at a few specific sciences, first starting with philosophy of the human person. Philosophy of the human person is also called philosophical anthropology or philosophy of human psychology. This belongs to natural philosophy insofar as humans depend on sensible matter both to be and to be defined. For instance, you can't have a human without flesh and bones, without a heart and brain, and therefore humans depend on sensible matter, such as flesh, bones, heart, and brain, in order to be and to be defined. The human person also belongs to metaphysics insofar as the human soul is an immaterial substance. Philosophy of the human person differs from what is studied in psychology departments since psychology departments engage in a mixed science. They study the human person or the human soul not as a natural object, but instead as an object of mathematics. Now that we've looked at philosophy of the human person, let's look at metaphysics. The first thing to note is that metaphysics has four names. The first and most common name is metaphysics, which comes from the parts meta and physics. It just means after physics or beyond physics. That's because in the order of learning, we're supposed to learn metaphysics after having first studied natural philosophy or physics. The second name for metaphysics is divine science or natural theology. Theology just means the same thing as divine science because it comes from theo and logos, meaning study of God. Metaphysics is called theology in a derivative sense because it considers God as the principle of all beings. A third name for metaphysics is first philosophy. That's because metaphysics studies the first causes of all things and therefore gives principles to all the other sciences. The fourth name for metaphysics is wisdom. This name is closely related to the name first philosophy. Since metaphysics studies the first principles of all things, it's able to judge the first principles of all the other sciences and therefore one with metaphysics is the most wise. The parts of metaphysics are as follows. The first is critique, which is the study of human knowledge in general. The second is ontology, which comes from the Greek word for being, on. This defends the general principles of all being. These are the principles which are common to every science, such as the principle of non-contradiction, that a thing can't both be and not be at the same time in the same respect and the principle of the excluded middle, that there's no middle between affirmation and negation. The third, print, the third part of metaphysics is ousiology. This is the study of sensible substances, which in Greek are called ousia, 
Metaphysics studies sensible substances as a means of knowing about immaterial substances. The final part of metaphysics is natural theology, which is the study of immaterial substances such as God and angels as the principles of sensible substances. Now it's often tricky to distinguish between logic and metaphysics. Sometimes logic is called a liberal art, and sometimes it's called a speculative science by Thomas Aquinas. As a liberal art, logic studies spoken words. This study is called an art because it is aimed at producing habits of clear and orderly thinking. We study logic in order to produce a quality in the mind by which we're able to think clearly and in an orderly fashion. Logic is also called a science. In this respect, logic is closely related to metaphysics. Like metaphysics, it studies all beings, but in a different way. Metaphysics studies all beings as they are in themselves outside the mind. Logic, in contrast, studies all beings as they are as conceived by the mind. It's also often difficult to distinguish between metaphysics and sacred theology, but it's important to do so. Both metaphysics and sacred theology are called theology, but they're not the same science. Metaphysics is called natural theology, whereas sacred theology is called revealed theology. Metaphysics and sacred theology are called theology for very different reasons. Metaphysics studies God as a principle of sensible things, using natural reason. Sacred theology, in contrast, studies God as a subject of the science, under the aspect of his own knowledge of himself revealed to us in scripture and tradition.